Once you've installed V-Ray for Blender, the first thing to do is head over to Blender's preferences. In the add-ons menu, make sure V-Ray for Blender is enabled. When you expand that section, you'll find a link to the documentation homepage, packed with detailed info on everything V-Ray related. And if you run into any issues along the way, don't hesitate to reach out and report them. Your feedback really helps us fine tune and improve the V-Ray experience inside Blender. Next, head over to the Render Properties panel and set the render engine to V-Ray. V-Ray comes with two rendering options, CPU and GPU. While they work differently under the hood, the results they produce are quite similar, though not perfectly identical. So depending on your scene, you might spot a few subtle differences. By default, GPU rendering is set to CUDA mode. That's a hybrid setup, which means it can use both your CPU and GPU to speed things up. You can also switch to RTX mode by checking this box. It relies solely on the GPU for ray tracing acceleration, though in some scenes, CUDA may still render faster or more efficiently. For now, let's stick with using the CPU render engine. You'll also notice a V-Ray menu up in the top toolbar. From here, you can easily add cameras, lights, and geometry to your scene. And if you're ever unsure about a specific setting, there's a handy link to the online documentation right in the menu, so help is always just a click away. While we're on the topic, we'd love for you to check out the V-Ray for Blender Ideas portal at the link below. It's a space where users like you can submit suggestions, browse what others have proposed, and upvote features you'd like to see in future updates. At the top level menu, you'll also find access to the Chaos Cosmos Library, a curated collection of high quality 3D content. It's packed with ready to render models, realistic materials, HDR skies, and more. Bringing these assets into your scene is quick and hassle-free. If you're eager to dive right in, go ahead and import a few models and an HDR to start rendering. In this example, I've set up a simple scene with a cartoon character in a studio environment. To begin rendering, just click the Start Interactive Render button in the top right corner. This opens up the V-Ray frame buffer, where your final image will be displayed and saved. Alternatively, you can send the image to the cloud for rendering. That way, you can keep working on your project locally, while Chaos Cloud takes care of the final render in the background. While we're here on the Chaos Cloud page, let's quickly explore Chaos Collaboration, a platform designed to make sharing your work easier with teammates and clients for feedback and reviews. Like most features, you can launch it straight from the main V-Ray menu. Once it opens, a dedicated window lets you create a new project and upload your image. From there, Anyone with access to the project can jump in, leave comments, and share suggestions. Let's take a quick look at the available rendering settings for your projects. You'll notice there are just four tabs, each offering detailed control over different aspects of your scene. You'll also see that V-Ray is nicely integrated into several properties panels. Let's begin with the View Layers panel. Under the Render Channels section, you'll find tools like Lightmix, the Denoiser, and a wide range of other render channels. Some help reconstruct the final image, often called the beauty pass, while others are great for tasks like adding contact shadows or creating masks for post-production work. When you activate a render channel from the View Layers tab, it's automatically added to the World Node Editor. This also happens if you create one directly in the Node Editor. You'll also find V-Ray integrated across other properties editors, giving you access to your selected assets in two ways through both the Node Editor and the Properties Editor. This dual approach offers more control and flexibility, and it helps create a smooth, streamlined workflow across different panels. Now let's move on to the World tab. When you pick a render channel, its options will appear here. This is also where you configure scene-wide effects like V-Ray Tune, or set up environment effects like Fog and Aerial Perspective. These features can add depth and a distinct creative flair to your scenes. All right. Let's look at the Object Properties tab. This gives you detailed control over individual objects in your scene. For instance, you can assign a unique object ID for masking, whether in the V-Ray frame buffer or in your post-production software. You can also manage the object's visibility and add custom user attributes to fine-tune how it behaves. It's all about giving you more control over how each object contributes to your final render. V-Ray is also built right into the Data tab. Scroll below the lens parameters and you'll find the V-Ray physical camera settings, key tools for controlling exposure through the classic triangle, aperture or F number, shutter speed, and ISO. Alternatively, you can tweak exposure with a single exposure compensation value. You'll also find controls for white balance, depth of field, motion blur, 
and lens distortion. Everything you need to make your camera act like the real thing. The data tab also gives you access to all the V-Ray light settings, so you can set up intensity, color temperature, and more. These settings ensure your camera and lights behave just like real-world counterparts. Finally, let's move on to the Material Properties tab. Once a V-Ray material is assigned to an object, all of its properties will appear here for easy editing. If you prefer working in the Node Editor, you can control the shader from the side panel, even if your Properties Editor is focused on a different tab. Just click the small arrow to make sure the panel is visible. This flexibility makes it easy to work with materials in whichever way suits your style. All right, let's dive into the V-Ray Node Editor. This node-based system lets you create, edit, and manage materials and textures using a flexible visual approach. To access it, simply choose any window you want to work in, expand the menu in the top left corner, and switch it to V-Ray Node Editor. There are three types of node trees available, one for shaders, one for objects, and one for the world. Let's break them down. Starting with the shader node tree, this is where you create and edit V-Ray materials. To add a new material, open the Add menu and explore a wide range of shaders like the standard V-Ray material, hair material, car paint, and more. You'll also find texture maps, UV mapping nodes, and other key tools here. You can even right-click in the editor to bring up the same menu. Now if you select a V-Ray light, the editor will automatically display its node, allowing you to tweak it using texture nodes. For example, by adding a custom texture for more precise fall-off control. Let's select a part of the car again and jump into the object node tree. This area lets you manage V-Ray geometries and object properties. Right-clicking opens a few additional categories of nodes that control matte settings, surface visibility, and more. From the geometry section, you can apply subdivisions or displacement to specific objects. At the top of each object output node, you can assign an object ID number. I've assigned a unique ID to each object, so after rendering in the V-Ray frame buffer, we can view the object ID pass, where each ID appears in its own unique color. This is super helpful during post-production when you want to quickly isolate or adjust individual elements. Next, let's look at the world node tree. This lets you control the overall scene settings, like environment and global illumination. Right-click in the graph to bring up a list of available nodes. For example, I'll choose the V-Ray Volume Tune node and connect it to the effects container. Now you'll see outlines around your objects, giving them a stylized, cartoon-like look. You can further customize this effect by adjusting the line thickness and color. Finally, let's take a look at the Render Channels container. Here's a key thing to remember. The V-Ray node editor and the Properties editor are fully interconnected. Any change you make in one is instantly reflected in the other. Let me show you. If I add a render channel in the world node editor and connect it to the render channels container, it shows up right away in the properties editor. Alternatively, I can enable the channels I need directly from the view layer tab. This dual workflow gives you the flexibility to work however you feel most comfortable. Now that we've covered how to create and control your scene at the node level, let's move on to global render settings that influence your final image. All right, now let's take a closer look at the tabs inside the render settings. Starting with the GI tab, this is where you control global illumination for your scene. You can toggle GI on or off, choose a secondary engine, and adjust its settings. Just a heads up, the primary GI engine is always set to brute force, so the only one you can change is the secondary engine. If you want to add caustics to your scene, those light patterns you see when light passes through glass or reflects off water, you can enable and configure them in the rollout just below. Next up is the Globals tab, which, true to its name, manages scene-wide settings. Here you can tweak things like displacement for the entire scene, or enable automatic white balance and auto camera exposure. Now let's visit the least populated of the tabs, the System tab. This one lets you control how the V-Ray frame buffer window behaves, and how much detail you want to see in the log output. And finally, let's circle back to the first tab, the Sampler. V-Ray offers two sampling modes, Progressive and Bucket. They both use similar settings like minimum and maximum subdivisions and noise threshold, but their defaults can differ since they work in fundamentally different ways. A key setting here is the noise threshold, which sets the acceptable level of noise in your final image. Lowering this value results in a cleaner image, but at the cost of longer render times. The defaults are well balanced, so it's a good idea to start with those. Let's say you've only got five minutes to spare. You can ask V-Ray to render until it reaches a noise threshold of 0.01, 
or until the five minutes are up. That's super helpful for animators working under tight deadlines or when you want to squeeze the most out of your render time. Now, let's switch the sampler to bucket mode and see what's new there. Unlike progressive, which refines the whole image continuously, bucket mode renders the image square by square, like a jigsaw puzzle. Each bucket finishes its area before moving on to the next. Bucket mode shares many of the same settings, but also adds a handy feature, firefly removal. This helps clean up ultra bright pixels without wasting valuable render time trying to resolve them naturally. You can also set bucket size and define the bucket order, which controls the sequence in which image blocks are rendered. Before we wrap up the rendering settings part, here's a neat trick for viewport rendering. If you're rendering interactively in the viewport, click the options next to the interactive render button to apply a denoiser directly in the viewport. And with that, you've got everything you need to get started with V-Ray's render settings. Now it's time to explore the tool you'll use to view and refine your final output. Now let's focus on the V-Ray frame buffer and explore all the powerful features it offers for image management, color correction, and more. Let's start interactive rendering in the frame buffer from this icon in the top right corner. Once your render begins, your image will appear in the VFB, along with all the render channels you've enabled, accessible through this drop-down menu. On the left side of the window, you'll find the History Panel, an incredibly useful tool that stores multiple renders and lets you compare them side by side. To use it, simply activate it in the VFB settings. Over on the right, the layer drawer gives you access to a full suite of image adjustments. Here you can apply correction layers for things like hue and saturation, exposure, filmic tone mapping, and even lookup tables for advanced grading. Simply load your favorite one, browse through different looks, and find the right amount you need using the opacity value. You'll also find options to enable lens effects and chromatic aberration, helping you mimic subtle imperfections from real-world cameras. Now let's dive into one of the most powerful tools in the VFB, LightMix. Once enabled in the render channels, LightMix allows you to adjust your scene's lighting directly in the frame buffer without having to re-render the entire image. You can tweak light colors and intensities in real time, test different setups, and quickly find the mood or atmosphere that works best. Next, let's check out the two handy buttons just beside the interactive rendering icon. The first is follow mouse. Let me start rendering using the bucket sampler type, so it is even easier to demonstrate it. Now this feature tells V-Ray to prioritize rendering wherever your mouse is hovering. It's great for focusing on specific parts of the image during look dev. Right next to it is the render region tool, which lets you define a specific area to render. It can be a simple rectangle or even a custom polygonal shape. This is perfect when you just want to preview a small section of your scene without re-rendering the entire frame. These are some of the main features in the V-Ray frame buffer to help you hit the ground running. We'll explore the rest in greater depth in a follow-up video. And finally, let's talk about sharing your work across platforms. With just a few clicks, you can export your scene as a .vr scene file right from the file menu. This format is supported by 3ds Max, Cinema 4D, Maya, Chaos Vantage, and many more. That means you can render the same scene on a totally different platform without needing to recreate lights, reassign shaders, or reposition cameras. It's a streamlined way to collaborate, and it frees you up to focus more on the creative side instead of wrestling with technical hurdles. And that's everything you need to get started with V-Ray for Blender, but we're just getting warmed up. Keep an eye out for upcoming videos where we dive deeper into advanced features, workflows, and expert tips. And if you found this helpful, be sure to subscribe to our media and entertainment YouTube channel and turn notifications on so you don't miss any future V-Ray for Blender content.